In the world of hedge funds and high finance, there are a few names that elicit as much awe and intrigue as that of Jim Simons. He's not just a billionaire, he's a mathematical virtuoso, a codebreaker of the stock market, and a philanthropist on a mission to unlock the secrets of the universe. From my perspective, Jim reminds me a lot of Dolly D. Gann in his mathematical knowledge. Today we delve into the life, the mind, and the legacy of a man who transformed the financial landscape and forever altered our understanding of what's possible when numbers meet intuition. My father had made a little bit of money and um, I had the, had the opportunity to try investing it and that was interesting and I thought you know I'm going to try another career altogether and so I went into the money management business so to speak. So you started with some of your dad's money and that got you a taste yeah. for an interest in yeah, it? Yeah, some family money and then some other people put up some money and uh, I did that. Uh, no models, no models for the first two years. So what were you doing then? You were just using cunning and, uh, you know, just no, like, like normal people do. Like normal people do. And I brought in a couple of people to work with me. And uh, we were extremely successful. I think it was just plain good luck, but nonetheless, we were very successful. But I could see that this was a very gut-wrenching business. You know, you come in one morning, you think you're a genius, the markets are for you. We were trading currencies and commodities and financial instruments and so on, not stocks, but those kinds of things. And the next morning you come and you feel like a jerk, the market's against you. It was very gut-wrenching. And in looking at the patterns of prices, I could see that there was something we could study here, that there were maybe some ways to predict prices uh, mathematically or statistically. And I started working on that and then brought in some other people and gradually we built models and the models got better and better and finally the models replaced the fundamental stuff. So it took a while. I would have thought, with your background and mathematician, this would have almost occurred to you immediately, like you would have straight away seen this. Well, what, what was the two-year delay? Well, two things. I saw it pretty early, but, and I brought in a guy who was a wonderful guy, also from the code cracking place, and he was, uh, I thought, together we'll, we'll start building models. That was fairly early but it wasn't right away. But he got more interested in the fundamental stuff and he says the models aren't going to be very strong and so on and so forth. So we didn't get very far. But I knew there were models to be made. Then I brought in another mathematician and a couple more and a, and a better computer guy. And then we started making models which really worked. But you know, the, the general, uh, there's something called the efficient market theory. which says that there's nothing in the data, let's say price data, which will indicate anything about the future, because the price is sort of always right. The price is always right in some sense. But that's just not true. So there are anomalies in the data, even in the price history data. For one thing, uh, commodities especially used to trend, uh, not dramatically trend, but trend. So if you could get the trend right, you'd bet on the trend and you'd make money more often than you wouldn't, whether it was going down or going up. That was an anomaly in the, in the data, but gradually we found more and more and more and more anomalies. None of them is so overwhelming that you're going to clean up on a particular anomaly because if they were, other people would have seen them. So they have to be subtle things. And you put together 
uh, a collection of these subtle anomalies and you begin to get something that will predict pretty well. For one thing, uh, commodities especially used to trend, uh, not dramatically trend, but trend. So if you could get the trend right, you'd bet on the trend and you'd make money more often than you wouldn't, whether it was going down or going up. That was an anomaly. In the, in the data, but gradually we found more and more and more and more anomalies. None of them is so overwhelming that you're going to clean up on a particular anomaly, because if they were, other people would have seen them. So they have to be subtle things. And you put together uh, a collection of these subtle anomalies and you begin to get something that will predict pretty well. How elaborate are these things? Because in my head I'm imagining, you know, some equation like uh, like Pythagoras equation, you put a few numbers in and something spits out, but are these giant beasts of equations and algorithms or are they, are they simple things? Uh, it, well, the, the system as it is today is, is extraordinarily elaborate. But it's not a whole lot of, it, you know, it's, it's what's called machine learning. So you find things that are predictive. You might guess, oh, such and such should be predictive, might be predictive, and you test it out in the computer and maybe it isn't, maybe it isn't. You test it out on long-term historical data and uh, price data and other things. And then you add to the system this if it, if it works, and if it doesn't, you, you, you throw it out. So there aren't elaborate equations, at least not for the prediction part. But the prediction part is, the only, is not the only part. You have to know what your costs are when you trade. Uh, you're going to move the market when you trade. Now, the average person will make a buy 200 shares of something and he's not going to move the market at all because it's too small. But if you want to buy 200,000 shares, you're going to push the price. How much are you going to push the price? How are you going to, you know, are you going to push it uh, so far that you, you, <laughs> you can't make any money because you've distorted things so much? So you have to understand costs and that's something that's, that's important. And then you have to understand how to minimize the volatility of the whole of the whole assembly of positions that you have and, and be, uh, uh, so you have to do that. Th that last part uh, takes some fairly sophisticated applied mathematics, not uh, earth shattering, but, but fairly sophisticated. What discipline of mathematics or disciplines? Is it multidisciplinary or are we yeah, talking? It's mostly statistics. It's mostly statistics and uh, some, uh, some probability theory. And, uh, but I can't get into you know, what things we do, do use and what things we don't use. We, we reach for different things that might come, that might be effective. Uh, so we're very universal. We don't have any, any uh, but it's a big computer model. For one thing, there's a, there is a capacity to the major model. It can manage a certain amount of money, which is rather large, but it, can, it can't manage an enormous amount of money because you're pushing, you're going to end up pushing the market around too much. So it's kind of a sweet spot as to how much it's reasonable to manage. Therefore, it would never grow into some behemoth which would, uh, you know, take everybody out and you'd be the only player. I mean, well, of course, if you were the only player, there'd be no one to play against. There are, there are limitations, at least uh, the, the, way, the, way we, the way we see it. Uh, but we keep, we keep improving it. We have about, about 100 PhDs working for the firm. That's what I mean. I mean, how did you get to that point? Did you start to think, we, we just, need this, we need that? What did... We just hired smart people. My, my, my algorithm has always been 
you get smart people together. Uh, you give them a lot of freedom. Create an atmosphere where everyone talks to everyone else. They're not hiding in a corner with their own little thing. They talk to everybody else. And you provide the best uh, infrastructure, the best computers and so on that people can work with, and make everyone partners. So that was the model that we used in, in, in Renaissance. So we would bring in smart folks and uh, they didn't know anything about finance. Uh, but they learned. What was your cr employment criteria then? If they knew nothing about finance, what were you looking for in them? Uh, someone with a PhD in physics and who'd had uh, five years out and had written a few good papers and was obviously a smart guy or in astronomy. Uh, or in mathematics, or in statistics. What was your cr employment criteria then? If they knew nothing about finance, what were you looking for in them? Uh, someone with a PhD in physics, and who'd had uh, five years out, and had written a few good papers, and was obviously a smart guy. Or in astronomy, uh, or in mathematics, or in statistics. Uh, someone who had done science and done it well and was interested in, you know, uh, applying his mind or her mind, although it was mostly his, to, uh, you know, modeling markets and making money.